All right, uh, I think we're basically ready. So first of all, thank you all for coming here today. I'm really thrilled to be here to share what I think is really, really exciting. Uh, and as just to understand what my audience is like, uh, show of hands, how many of you have never done machine learning uh, yet? Okay, cool. How many of you have uh, already tried something with machine learning, at least something? Okay. How many of you have done work with Keras specifically? Uh, and how many of you, how many of you are, uh, are thinking you're sort of intermediate and above in machine learning? Okay. So, um, full disclosure, I am in some ways a beginner, but I have some background in uh, teaching, so I think I can present things quite well. Uh, I have read uh, quite a lot over the past months, and uh, I feel like I have enough that I can share that will be a value to some of you, at least some of you. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try to share something of value. Okay, so my talk is titled Zero to Hero in Machine Learning with Keras. And uh, one of the reasons I chose Keras is because it was highly recommended to me. It looks like it's one of the most popular framework uh, uh, libraries out there to use. And uh, there is a magnificent book about it uh, that kind of gets you from nowhere to all of a sudden understanding how to do it. And uh, that's the one that I used. So brief outline. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about machine learning, how to get started with it. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the workflow, tools that you can use, some examples, and we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, a bit about me. I was a math teacher for a while. And uh, then um, I jumped ship to become a web developer. And I was doing front end and still am at Forbes, uh, working mostly with Angular. But I have the fortune of being able to learn uh, as I go along. And we have a data team uh, at Forbes. And so I've been learning quite a bit from there as well. So my manager knew that I was interested in machine learning and highly recommended this book. This book has been recommended in other areas. So I thought I may as well do it. And I think it is magnificent. I haven't read any other books, so it's hard to compare. But what I can tell you is the presentation is very, very clear. It goes through pretty much all the basics and gets you to understand how machine learning works. And much of what I'll present to you today will be basically from that book. Uh, all the code that I'll show to you as well will be examples from the book and a little bit of what I've done. So uh, what's machine learning? I'm sure a lot of you already know. But it is a really, really powerful tool that is able to do more and more as we discover new techniques and ways to do things. So some of you may have seen this before. This is called deep fakes, kind of a, a nice hashtag term for taking a video and then replacing the face. And then if you remember the movie Face Off, you know, there's a Nicolas Cage who talked about taking the face off. And what we have is Nicolas Cage with his face off. <laughs> so machine learning is really, really powerful. And that gets me really excited because I feel like it's kind of like a big, fun playground where you can do a lot of things. But then, of course, there is uh, financially lucrative applications as well. So types of learning, this isn't an exhaustive list, but kind of just a general topology of it. There's the supervised learning, uh, where you provide data to the machine and you tell it, this is the correct answer and this is the data that you need to correlate it with. There's the unsupervised learning, where you give it maybe a lar large amount of data and say, try to find out patterns, maybe subdivide this into meaningful regions. So maybe Netflix could recommend this category to people. Uh, there's self-supervised learning and there's reinforcement learning. Reinforcement is the kind of thing where you can teach a machine to play an Atari game and then beat it consistently with perfect scores. And reinforcement learning is kind of a, you can think of genetic algorithms where you provide a goal and then whenever that thing succeeds, you kind of make it do that thing again, yeah, roughly speaking. But today what I'll be talking about is supervised learning. Uh, there's a nice graph. I'll be sharing the, uh, the slides to this talk later, so you can just look at it in more in depth. This is not exhaustive in any way, it's just a rough outline. But you can think of machine learning as kind of this big category that breaks up into pieces. Uh, there's the discovery, there's the predicting, and there's reinforcement learning. We will talk about supervised learning, which is basically predicting something from data that you've been given. And the general idea is you need to have a lot of data 
you need to then have labels for that data saying, this is the correct answer based on these variables being this way, and if the variables are different, the correct answer is this. And I'll provide examples more, I'm speaking kind of abstractly. Um, there is a really beautiful visualization that maybe can help people get a sense of what's going on. If you've not seen this before, I really encourage you to play around with it on your own. So um, I loaded this up. This is a, kind of an approximation of how things might work. You have uh, some data. So here's a data set with, uh, you see, circles. Uh, you have some data, which is something, and just abstract, doesn't matter. But we know the correct labels, the orange thingies and the blue thingies. And what you want to do is you don't want to write a program that will, you know, where you manually instruct it what to do. You just want the computer to figure it out. And so what you do is you provide uh, some input. And then you provide these neurons. And then you say, hey, train this thing. And after a while, it figures stuff out. So what you see is now it somehow figured out that anything in this region is most likely to be blue. And anything outside is most likely to be orange. And it does that by using these layers. These are layers of we call them neurons, and these neurons are basically, you can think of them little units that will do some kind of processing. And I'll describe what those are. But you can add more layers and you can add more neurons, and then depending on the kind of data you're trying to classify, you might need a different architecture, a different setup, or maybe different number of items. And so let's train it again, and hooray, after a while it just figures it out. But then of course if you have very complicated data, and you try to figure it out, you might not ever actually find a very good solution. It will maybe not do it. So you'll have to play around with your model. This is called a model. You're, you're building a model. You're building a prediction machine. And you'll have to maybe change something called activation. Maybe you'll change the learning rate. And you will play around with these parameters, maybe add more uh, neurons, maybe add more neurons here. I don't know. Let's see if it gets anywhere. And over time, if you're lucky, you'll get an answer. But that's kind of a very high-level overview of a bit of machine learning. So let's come back to the presentation. Uh, machine learning has a lot of vocabulary. So there are a lot of terms that will be thrown around. And it's good to be familiar with them. Um, I'll basically go through these. This isn't an exhaustive list. But I think when you, became, when you become more familiar with, these, with this terminology and what it does, you'll, you'll kind of get a better sense of what machine learning is about. By the way, I keep saying the phrase machine learning. I, I think maybe a more appropriate term would be deep learning. So machine learning, you can think of it as a huge set of different approaches and techniques. And deep learning is just a subset. And that's uh, actually what I'm talking about, deep learning today. So there are things called layers. It's what you saw in the previous example. You have uh, a certain architecture with certain layers. They're just uh, exactly what the word sounds like. <laughs> um, then you have tensors. Uh, tensor is, um, you can think of it as a mathematical object, basically. It is a, if you remember from, from math, there are uh, matrices and vectors and scalars. Basically, it is a box with numbers. Think of it like that. So you might have a box with a single number in it, so it's a scalar, or a box with a row of numbers, just it's a vector. Or if you have a two-dimensional thing, you will have a matrix. And then you can have more complicated objects, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, many more dimensional, and then the items inside might be tensors themselves. So complicated object. But even though machine learning, we talk about these neurons and layers, um, you, you shouldn't make the parallel too close to the brain. It's not really what it does. What we have is just a set of mathematical operations, and we are feeding a lot of data through them. And by using certain kinds of techniques, we're making the, those, um, those little pieces do some kind of work that happens to predict outcomes. Um, Let's see. So the next up is gradient descent. When you are trying to solve a problem, you are going to figure out what your goal is. The, the correct prediction is something, and you are trying to get your model to predict that.
But when it predicts incorrectly, you have to tell it that it is wrong. And that distance from far, how far away, how, how wrong it is, you kind of give it that feedback. And what you want to do is you want to minimize that error rate. So far, is this okay? Making sense? And so that error rate, as it goes down, you could think of it as a kind of a kind of a valley inside a complicated uh, terrain. And the lower you get in that valley, the lower that error rate is. By the way, that error rate is called loss. So machine learning gets to go down this valley and find the lowest possible space, the uh, uh, smallest possible place in it. And of course, the valley can be a lot more complicated. And the closer you get to the bottom, the lower your loss, the better your predictions. So gradient descent is basically this technique for figuring out the answers. Now we can talk about optimizers. It's a word you'll hear. Optimizers are the way that you're going to go down this valley. And so these are pictures that are a little bit tricky maybe to figure out what's going on. But if you remember topological maps, um, this is kind of, imagine the, the, the lighter color is the lower location and the darker blue color is the higher location. So you are going down a hill and you're trying to end up in one of the two valleys. And so there is another beautiful visualization of it online. Let me pull it up. And these four different things that you will see are different algorithms, different optimization techniques for getting to that valley. And so some of them might get down to the valley much quicker and some might be slower. And so when you build your model, you're going to have to make a lot of decisions about how your model is organized and how it's set up. Uh, those decisions are called hyperparameters because there are things about the model that you decide. They're, they're kind of hyper above. So one of the decisions is about what kind of a algorithm for going down the valley you'll choose. And some will yield results faster, but maybe will error out more. And if the valleys aren't nice like these two, you might get completely different results based on what you, what you choose. So a lot of machine learning is actually you trying different approaches to solve the problems and figuring out which of them are better than others. And you might just spend time figuring out which optimizer to use. So we've got some optimizers. Loss, the thing that I mentioned. Um, I, perhaps I should have arranged these slides in a slightly different order. But loss is, like I said, the amount that your model is predicting incorrectly. So in these two uh, cases you see on the left, if the model <coughs> predicted a line that is horizontal, the distance between any of the points, the actual outcomes, the actual predictions that it should have made, and the prediction that the model made is quite big. And so the loss in this example would be quite high. On the right, what you see is a better model, a model that fits the data a lot better, and the loss is lower because the distance between the points, the actual points and the predictions is smaller. So uh, in models, you're trying to minimize loss. And um, now another fun term, activation function. So every neuron that you're creating in these layers is going to be activated um, from the input. So you feed it some data, and that data is going to be provided to the input. And the input might either sort of fire or not fire. Think of it like a neuron in the brain. You know, don't take the, the, the analogy too far, but basically get some input, and now it needs to fire. And of course, because we have math, we can fire at a different rate. So maybe, so on the left, you see something called a sigmoid activation function. So when the input is zero, the output is around a half. And when the input is close to one, the output is one. And when the input is negative one, the output is close to zero. And basically, you have this smooth gradient between how much this neuron will fire based on the input that it's getting. And so that's another hyperparameter you're going to be choosing about the layers that you're going to be setting up. 
it turns out that while this may be a, a you know, pretty good, accurate way to model things in the world, it is computationally much more heavy than a simpler ReLU. ReLU is the rectified linear unit. I think the second U should be capitalized typically. But anyway, you can see it's a very, very simple function. It doesn't fire at all up to a certain point, and then afterwards it just fires at the amount at which it's getting. So there are different activations functions to choose. In the beginning, you don't have to worry about all of this too much. You'll just use regular RMS prop for the um, optimizer. You'll choose ReLU for the activation function, and you'll just try different things afterwards. Okay, so models are meant to predict the world, but there is this constant tension about overfitting. Uh, this picture, I hope, is quite demonstrative, but I'll explain what's happening. You have red, blue, red and blue dots, and you're trying to figure out how to partition this shape into meaningful regions. And if you draw a straight line, you're going to make quite a few errors. It's still better than random, but you'll make some errors. You can do better by drawing maybe a parabola shape, but if you want, you can get every single answer right. But then, what do you think will be the problem? If you make this model overfit, as you see on the right, then when you give it new examples, it is more likely to classify them incorrectly than the model in the middle. And this is typically going to happen when you train your models. If you don't stop your model early enough, it might start overfitting a lot. If you think about models as the, you know, the amount of power they have is the more layers you put in, the more powerful it would be, you know, that's kind of true. But if you put a lot of layers, and these layers are really, really large, they have a lot of processing power, they'll just memorize your entire data set. They will know exactly the correct answer and be 100% accurate with your data set. But when you give it new data, it will make some mistakes. So to prevent overfitting, there's a, a straightforward technique we use all the time. And that is, you have your training data, and then you take a small fraction of it, and you don't show it to your model at all that is while training. So you will train your model on let's say 90% of the data and you will have some kind of a model. And then you say, hey, let's validate and see how it does on data that it has never seen. And you show it 10% of that data that you preserved. You don't use that 10% to train your, your model at all. You just see how well it behaves. In fact, you could do that. You can monitor it as it's training to see how well it does on the validation set. And I'll show you some screenshots of what that looks like. But basically, if you are overfitting, oh, I have a picture of that, all right. So what you have here is uh, an example of what happened with a particular data set. The dots are training loss. So loss, again, is how different the predictions are from the actual. And so you see loss going down, and that's excellent. That means your model is learning and is getting better and better at predicting things in your data set. But what you'll also notice in this picture is the validation loss actually stagnates at some point. Meaning that while your model is getting better and better to predicting your training data, it actually stopped improving in predicting new data. And of course, if you give it completely new data set, you, know, uh, you, you, you might have even worse outcomes. So there's that consistent tension between underfitting and overfitting. And that's just kind of the art of machine learning. Uh, my manager has been a great guide to me, and he's been kind of giving me sage advice passed down. I hope, I hope it's useful to you, too. But he says, currently, it seems that a lot of machine learning is more like an art than a science. A lot of it is experimenting, trying different architectures, trying different things. And over time, you begin to build some heuristics, but that comes with practice and implementing a lot of different models. So let's take stock of the vocabulary. I, I've, I've gone through most of it, but I would love to elaborate if anybody has any questions or if I was unclear about anything. If anybody has any questions about any of this or any other terms I've mentioned. So let's take a look at some architectures. Um, the, these aren't exhaustive, but these three are really, really large categories that is worth knowing about. So there's the dense neural network, and I'll have examples of all of them. Dense neural network, or you can just call them dense, um, it's a one of them. There's the convolutional neural network, or CNN, or ConNet. And another one that's large is recurrent neural networks, RNN. And each one of these are more typically used for different kinds of problems. 
So when you have a particular problem, you also have to decide, well, which approach should I take? And in some ways, it may be quite easy. So let's take a look. A dense network looks something like this. You have an input layer with some exposed neurons. So these are the actual uh, pieces, um, actual locations where, where your input is going to be fed. So if you are telling your model about the colors of certain pixels, you will literally just say this pixel is represented by this particular neuron and whatever the value of that pixel, it'll be converted to a number and fed into that neuron. Then, because this is, this is called dense for a reason, every single neuron in subsequent layer is connected to every layer, every, every input layer, every neuron in the <coughs> input layer before. And so you stack enough of these together and then eventually what you do is you bring it down to a certain few number of neurons. In this case, there's four. In, in, in another case, maybe you're classifying between two things. You will have a one neuron or two? I forget. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, convnets. I find these really, really exciting. So convnets, what they do is they're convolution filters. If you've ever played in Photoshop, there is a convolution filter, which is basically um, a little rectangle with numbers that says you take three by three pixels. So uh, let me use my mouse to show you. Okay, so you take a certain section of an image, and convolution nets are usually for images. You take a certain section of an image, and then you maybe summarize what that pixel is in some way. And these convolution uh, filters might be able to detect edges, because what you're trying to do is find the contrast if there are any pixels on the left and on the right that are very different values. And then you say, oh, that's an that's a edge. Now the good news is you don't have to program that in. When you use connets, they actually will figure out what is relevant um, because of backpropagation. So you feed it a lot of data. It gets compressed down into smaller and smaller and smaller representation. But you can see the, the depth of these blocks is getting longer. And that's because these subsequent uh, convolution filters are looking at a smaller image, if you want to think of it that way. So rather than looking by a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel images, maybe looking by a 10 by 10 grid. But now it is trying to extract much more abstract ideas. So the depth of it is also those tensors that are able to represent those extra features. And then lastly, you, you stick a dense neural network that will then take the output of those convnets and classify it as a car track or van or whatever else it is. So um, I mentioned backpropagation only briefly, but I, I, I hope you are familiar with it. The basic idea is once the model is told, good job, you're right, it will propagate the, that result back. It will kind of go down the line backwards saying, hey, whichever neuron fired and agreed with this statement, please ramp it up and make it fire more the next time you see something like it, roughly speaking. Okay, so continents can be uh, a, a very long, dense, uh, sorry, very long chain of layers. It, this is an example of Google Net, and it was an image classification system which was very, very powerful. And roughly speaking, in the very early stages, um, oh yeah, you're able to see it. Uh, in the very early stages of the chain, it is able to pick up certain kinds of maybe edges, maybe color gradation differences. Later on in the chain, it's beginning to pick up certain textures. This isn't something you had to train it to do, it just did it by itself because of the feedback, because of the back propagation. And then lastly, it may be getting some really abstract ideas that may not in any way correlate with what we have in mind. When you look at this picture, you don't think a poodle, but for a convnet, that might mean exactly a poodle. So, convnets are really good for images because they are location-based. They, they know which section a certain filter is activated at. Oops. And so here's an excellent, beautiful, simple example which just shows you how it might work. Uh, I'm going to draw a number and what you see are these first layers that begin to detect certain kind of edges. Then maybe they begin to extract something a little more abstract 
And at some point, it's very hard to interpret, but you know, the, the machine is doing something. And lastly, you've got some dense layers, which literally have no positional elements whatsoever. They're just a row. But the machine correctly identifies, it, as you can see at the top, that it's a five. Ooh, it didn't do it correctly. So, you know, they do make mistakes. Okay, so continents are awesome, and they can do really powerful things. There's something called style transfer, where you use lower level information from this convolution, uh, from ConvNet, that kind of picks up the textures, and then you say, keep whatever the higher level objects there are, like a horse, but then apply that filter, which is zebra-like, and you can convert between zebras and horses, and so on, and of course, uh, make it look like your favorite painting. All right, last architecture to briefly overview is the RNN, recurrent neural network. These are things like in your iPhone, as you're typing, it is predicting the next word you might be typing. And what you do is you kind of feed the input back into itself. It's kind of like a feedback loop. And there's more than one way to organize these things, one-to-one, one-to-many, and so on. Okay, so let's get started with Keras. Sorry if this introduction was a bit too long. It, it, it's hard to know what the audience is ahead of time. I hope this was of use to the people who are just starting out. I can guarantee you that most of the room appreciate that. All right. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for that. So getting started with Keras turns out to be pretty simple. Um, I, I won't go through the minute, minute details of how to do some of these steps, but I imagine that you know installing Python 3.6 or above is pretty straightforward for you developers. You, you know, go online, find out how to do it. Uh, on the Mac, I believe that Mac comes with version 2 point something already installed. You can install version 3.6 or above. Side by side, it won't interfere. It, it should be fine. Um, you'll also want to install something called pip, which is like a package manager. If anybody's from uh, the node, you know, node.js type of thing, it's, it's the package.json file. It's, uh, sorry, pip is like the NPM of, of, uh, of Python. It installs Python packages. And then you'll want to install Venv, VNV, virtual environment. Uh, it is a tool that will allow you to go to a particular folder and set up dependencies directly in that folder so that they don't interfere with anything else you're doing. And so your regular Python installation should be safe while you're working inside your local environment. Uh, I personally recommend aliasing Python so that you don't have to type it out. Python 3, just do pi. Okay, so now commands. Once you've done all that, you go to whatever folder you have. In there, you're going to be telling Python, uh, so Python 3, uh, to create a folder called virtual environment, V-E-N-V. You can la label that whatever you want. I think that's the fourth word in here. So you do pi, dash m, then, and then whatever folder you want, I'll just call it then. And then you will activate that folder. That is, you'll tell your terminal that this is the environment you want to use. So you'll say source, and then the rest is then bin activate. If you've labeled the, that little subfolder differently, it'll be different in, in here. On Windows, there is a similar command. I made it darker to, for aesthetic reasons, but it's hard to see. It says then scripts activate .bat. Basically, a similar command that tells your terminal to do things. And lastly, you're going to install whatever de dependencies you have. pip install-r requirements.txt. That's basically all you'll need to have a fully working machine learning environment. You'll just need a requirements.txt file. That's something you can write on your own, and it looks like this. You tell Python, well, pip, what to install. Uh, in some of these lines, uh, you'll see equals equals and then some version number. You can do that manually. If you don't put a version number, it'll just install the latest one. So you'll definitely want to put in Keras, and you'll want to put in TensorFlow. Uh, I haven't talked about TensorFlow yet, but just the general outline. Um, oh yeah, I give it a, like soon enough. But TensorFlow is something you need, I'll talk about it in a moment. You can also, if you're using a desktop or a laptop that has an NVIDIA GPU, you can use TensorFlow GPU. Uh, machine learning can be 10 times, even 20 times faster if you have a GPU. For convolutional, filter, for convnets, it, it really makes a huge difference. Uh, it took uh, this laptop something like, I don't know, 
an hour to, to train five images, to, to generate five images using a particular framework, uh, particular approach. On my home machine with a GPU, I think it took five minutes or even less, or like whatever. Uh, there are a couple of other tools. Again, this talk, will, the slides will be available online so you don't have to take screenshots, but there are a couple of other tools that you will use and maybe I'll mention them later too. Okay, so workflow working with machine learning. Um, as Chris said, a lot of it is going to be massaging your data. Uh, but before you get to massaging your data, you, you're going to have to define your problem. Um, you, you'll figure out what it is that you want to solve, and then you're going to need a huge data set. The bigger your data set, the better your model will be, because well, more data, better results. And you'll have to choose a measure of success. So this is about you know, how, uh, how accurate your prediction is compared to what you want and what is it that you want. Um, speaking kind of vaguely, sorry, I can, I can explain later if somebody's interested. I, I'm not 100% sure exactly how to describe it. So uh, decide your evaluation protocol. This is about um, you know, when you're classifying things into buckets, for example. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little vague on this. All right, now prepare your data. That's an easy one. Preparing your data is going to be hard work. Uh, there's a, a thing called um, Kaggle. How many of you have heard of Kaggle? It's an online community where people participate in these little competitions. Some of them even have financial rewards, but they're a really, really good way to start to work with machine learning. What you have is a lot of data provided for you, and then there is a hidden validation set so that you can create a model and then you can submit it and then you will be told, congratulations, you predicted 80% of the data correctly or something of the sort. So I tried out an entry one and this one I recommend to all of you, it's called the Titanic set. Basically you have a lot of data that is about the people that were on the Titanic and then only two outcomes, either they survived or they didn't. So you try to use their age, their, the amount they paid for a ticket and so on to predict that outcome. But before you get there, you're, at least in my case, I think I spend 10 hours trying to figure out how to get this data to be represented in a way that the model would understand. And that's just because of inexperience. You know, my, my, uh, my mentor could have probably done in like 10 minutes or 20. But that is a big job. You're going to have to tr figure out how to convert this data. You also need to normalize your data. So if you imagine that some of the variables only vary between zero and one, and another variable is varying between 0 and 10,000, that variable will overpower your model. It will kind of be pushing all the buttons a lot more than the other. So typically what we do is we normalize the data between values between 0 and 1. It's not necessary, but it's typically going to improve your outcomes. So preparing data is going to be uh, quite a bit of work. The good news is once you prepare your data, it took me I don't know, less than a minute to get the model to actually predict with like 50 or like 40%, no, 70% accuracy or something. Anyway, so a lot of it is going to be data cleaning and doctrine. And then finally, you're going to iterate models. The first model I had was crap and I iterated a bunch and it got a little better and you'll do the same. Okay, so I'll share quite a bit about tools. The big thing here is TensorFlow. It is a big library that comes from uh, Google. It is really powerful and it does pretty much all the hard, cool machine learning stuff. You can interact with it directly, writing your code directly in TensorFlow. And that's, I think, what a lot of researchers may be doing when they're trying to implement something really intricate and something that's different. But there is a thing called Keras and the author of Keras, the same guy who wrote the book that I, that I praised earlier on, Francois Cholet, he calls it basically Lego bricks of machine learning. Because what you have are these very high level APIs for interacting with either TensorFlow or uh, there are I think two other or maybe three other back end things you could use. So you can use TensorFlow directly, but it's much, much easier to work with Keras. Um, a lot of the Kaggle competitions are won with Keras, and a lot of researchers who work with machine learning do use Keras because it's so quick and easy to iterate models. 
you can change a model with one line of code. You can add 20 more layers with just adding 20 lines of code. It is really powerful, and uh, I'll share a little bit about it. And then data cleaning. I don't know what data cleaning tools there are and ways to massage your data, but this is a cool tool I've heard of from years ago. It was Google Refine, and then it became Open Refine. And this is kind of a piecemeal screenshot that I put together from several things. But what you see is data that you might get might not have consistent labeling. Maybe things will be misspelled or miscategorized. Google Refine, and I'm sure other tools like it, will be able to notice that in this column, a few things actually are misspelled. And they'll say, hey, would you like to change it? It will notice whether the data is maybe as a string rather than a number, and it'll normalize it for you upon your you know, acceptance. So you will have to do quite a bit of that, and this is one tool that you might use. A very powerful tool in Python, I don't know if you've heard of this, is Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And it is magnificent. It is a place where you can write your code and you can write annotations so that you can even share with your uh, coworkers and say, this is what I'm doing. But one of the coolest things is you can run your code in different order. And after you run a bunch of code and you want to go back and change something, you can just change that piece and rerun that piece. And that may be very valuable. You might have a very large notebook with a lot of steps that you're going through. First step, extract your data. Then uh, run a script to clean up your data. Then run a script to maybe show what the data looks like so you get an understanding of what it is. And then if the data doesn't look right, you just change the way you format it, rerun that piece to show the data again. And once you're happy, now you start building your models. You build your model, it doesn't work. Well, you just change that little bit and rerun that. So you wouldn't have to rerun your entire script. You'd just be able to rerun pieces. So Jupyter Notebooks is really awesome, and it's very easy to work with. Um, basically, you say Jupyter Notebook in your command line, and it comes up. Uh, Jupyter Notebook has been uh, slowly transitioning to this new cool thing that's currently in beta. It's called Jupyter Lab. It's basically the same thing, but cooler and better somehow. I don't, I don't know all the details, so uh, don't quote me on this, but uh, it looks like better UI, maybe a little bit more uh, things that it can do, or at least in the future. All right, and lastly of the tools that I'll share today is TensorBoard. And this is really, really powerful for monitoring your data. When you're working with a little bit of data and a small model, it might take seconds to build the whole, to, to train the whole thing. But you might be working with a data set of, I don't know, a few gigabytes of text, which you're processing and trying to figure out something, and it might take several hours. You don't want to wait for several hours to get that result back. You want to look at it and say, wait, something has gone wrong. And TensorBoard is, it's from the same guys from TensorFlow, of course, but Keras has a very simple way of interacting with it. In Keras, you can just output your logs that are already prepared for TensorBoard, and then in TensorBoard, you will live be able to see what's going on. So in this particular screenshot, I, you know, I just found it online, but it's indicative of what's going on. Here, uh, you, you don't, maybe you don't see it, but it says loss, and this is what's happening over time. And over time, uh, what is time in terms of machine learning? There's a word called epoch. Uh, am I pronouncing it right? Epoch, <laughs> that word. Uh, it means how many times the model has seen the entirety of your uh, data set. So in this particular example, it looks like the model, in order to get its loss down, has seen the data set 240 times. So after it saw the entire data set, once we had back propagation that went through all the layers, updating all the neurons to change their weights about how they're going to fire next time. And then we ran through the model again, through the data set again and again and again. And so over time, in this case 240 times, your, your loss is going down. Okay, and that's roughly it. So I have actual codes. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's the actual more important thing of it all. So let's see some code. Keras is wonderful to get started because it provides in its API a lot of data sets that you could use right out of the box. You don't have to try to massage it to make it ready for the models, it's already there. And all this code that I'll be showing you, I have in a repository. And by the way, none of this is magic. This code is pretty much the same thing as you would find in the book. 
and the book comes with a free GitHub repository. So you could glance at my code, you can glance at the code from uh, Francois Cholet, and he also has Jupyter notebooks that you can run which have annotations about what's going on. So how does it work? Um, I have a hack that's basically so that it doesn't console log some crap I don't like. Uh, don't worry about that. But you say from Keras, we're going to import some data sets, and the data set is going to be road, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, the, the news data set. And it has a lot of text. You have some parameters when you're importing it. In this case, we're going to import only 10,000 most common words. It automatically is imported into training data, train labels, uh, train test data and test labels. Um, we can print out to see what it looks like and how long it is, and then we're going to print out a little bit of it. Let's just see what it looks like. Python news and a okay cool. All right, now it started training. But what you see at the top is you have about 8,000 pieces of data. You have about 2,000 pieces of test data that you will not give to your model to train. You'll only give it to you'll only give it that to see how it's doing um, for yourself. Okay, while it's training, we'll we'll see what else happens. So data still needs to be massaged in some ways. And so when your data is just a lot of words, you need to somehow represent that to your model. And models are really good at understanding numbers. So what we do is something called one-hot encoding. One-hot encoding goes something like this. You have a huge vector that is 1,000 uh, or 10,000 items long. And most of it is zeros. But some of those values are one. And if it is one, that means that article contains that particular word. Maybe it'll have like number two if it's uh, you know, occurring twice. I'm not quite sure about the, uh, in the implementation here. So we convert it to one hot, so you do a little bit of work. Uh, I'm, I'm going through this a bit quicker because there are a lot of examples and I can always uh, show more details in the end. So now this comes uh, to the fun part about Keras. Keras is awesome. You say, hey Keras, let's get some models, let's get some layers. The model we're going to build is a sequential one. And sequential is basically all that I've shown you up to this point. These are things that are strung one after the other, layer after layer after layer. There is no more complications. Keras is able to handle a lot more complicated things. You might just have to spend a little bit more time setting it up. You might have a model that consists of two separate models taking your data and then doing slightly different things with it and then the output of those two models is fed into yet a third model that will be the final kind of, you know, it's going to take and summarize the, 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 the results from there. So the API is super easy to use. You say, hey model, let's add a layer. What kind of a layer? It's going to be a dense layer. This layer will have 46 uh, uh, neurons will have a certain kind of activation. And then in the first layer, you have to tell it its shape. It needs to know what is it expecting. So it is expecting a 10,000 long vector, I believe. I'm very sorry. I'm not 100% sure on this. But the cool thing about uh, Keras is that every subsequent layer will know what comes before it. And you don't have to connect the pieces It'll just do it for you. You just say, hey, let's have a bunch of neurons and have this activation. Let's have a bunch of neurons. Let's have this activation. So now this activation I haven't talked about, it's called softmax. Softmax is instead of trying to classify, one second, I might be misremembering. Could somebody fill in, um, is softmax the one where you, you put it into two categories or no? Softmax, I think, is between, before many. One to many, that's right, yeah. And if you want uh, uh, between two, then there is cross entropy, I think. Is that right? Uh, binary, binary cross entropy, yeah. So all this stuff you can look up. Keras has, a, I think, a pretty good documentation. And of course, a very large uh, community. So you can ask, and people will help out. Sorry that I'm a little wobbly about some of this. Um, but anyway, so softmax, what it'll do is it will then output a set of probabilities saying, across these 46 categories, which one is it going to be? And it'll say maybe 20% chance it's this category. 
Finally, you're going to compile your model and you're going to tell it its optimizer. So remember, as you're walking down this uh, terrain, as you're trying to minimize the loss, you have to say, which technique are you going to use? These optimizers have a lot of variables that you can also use, also change, so these hyperparameters. You can maybe give it something called uh, momentum. So as it's going down this valley, it will have a certain kind of a speed. Imagine a big, heavy ball rolling down a valley. So if it encounters a little hill ahead of it, it'll just kind of steamroll and keep going. And so sometimes you might want momentum in there. Uh, Keras allows you to add those hyperparameters very easily. Uh, I don't know the syntax right here, but it would just be a little bit more that you would type in there. Okay, then there's loss. Categorical, uh, categorical cross entropy. This is the one where you are putting things into categories. Hmm. I'm sorry, I just don't remember if I'm splitting this into, I think I'm splitting this because these are news articles. I'm splitting them, I think, into 46 categories. So it's maybe a sports article or something else. Anyway, you have some validation and uh, the validation set is just the last thousand items. The partial training set is the first thousand items. And last step of it all is you say fit, model fit. This is what actually is going to perform the training. You give it the input and you give it the labels, so the correct answers. If you don't have the correct answers, this thing is not going to do anything. It'll say, well, how can I learn? So you give it the data, you give it the correct answers, epochs. So here we're running it for 20 times, meaning the model will see exactly 20 times the, the full data set. And you saw it, um, it ran through it 20 times. Batch size is how many items will the model see before it goes and updates. So I give it 516 articles and then it is going to make some computations and through back propagation update its model. Typically batch sizes I think are uh, powers of two for better computation speed, although I think uh, you, you, know, you can definitely do it differently, but I think typically they're powers of two. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and then there's validation data. Now validation data is not necessary, but this is how I was able to then see a plot and I saw that the training, training data is improving, but the validation is kind of staying the same. I believe the next picture we'll see is actually accuracy. And so you can see the accuracy is going up and it's plateauing close to 100% on the training data, but our validation kind of hovers around 80. So what that means is you might be getting a little bit of overfitting. You're, you're, not, you're not getting any better with that, with the training set. So how would I change this model if I wanted more layers? Well, ta-da, got a bunch more layers. Keras is absolutely fantastic. You can change the variables and now you have a completely new model. Uh, one other thing that is really cool is uh, model.summary. And what you will do, what, what it'll do is it'll show you what the model looks like. So I change the model, I'm running it again. I'm not using the, um, the tools that I showed you like uh, Jupyter Notebook or the TensorBoard to do this, but uh, it's fine. So you see you have an output of what the model looks like and you see trainable parameters. So this model is actually trying to tune about 700,000 knobs at the same time to get better predictions. Now the model is heavier, there's more stuff going on, so it'll take a little bit longer, but in the end we'll see what kind of output we get. If I was running TensorBoard, I would be able to see it live, exactly all the, all the data as it's happening. TensorBoard also allows you to see um, into the model a little bit better. Uh, and then another cool thing with, oh yeah, so uh, we have the model, again, it's improving, but the validation data isn't improving. So, Maybe I need to try a different approach. We'll see. Okay. There are a bunch of different things that I have um, replicated from the book. Uh, there is convolutional network, for example, ConvNet. ConvNets are basically the best thing we have for vision. You can uh, solve this problem, you're seeing this, right? You can solve this problem without convolutional filters just with deep neural networks, but because deep neural networks, when you're presenting this data, 
are going to unwrap all the pixels into kind of a, a long line, it doesn't have positional data, so it's much harder for it to learn. If you're using convolutional filters, though, it will be a lot easier. So ConvNet, MNIST. MNIST is the data set that, it, that is trained on handwritten digits. So let's run that one. ConvNet. And what I find remarkable about machine learning is it's really, really fast. And uh, if you set up your model right, you will get amazingly accurate results. So this particular model goes through a couple of steps. First, you have a convolution filter, which goes, again, through every section of the image, trying to extract useful images. In this case, uh, the input shape is 26 by 26, because that's how many pixels we are working with. 32 is kind of the depth. It's the uh, amount of information that your model is going to be able to extract. Think of it kind of like uh, how many di directions it can like look at. Then you do max pooling, which is kind of trying to compress that information into a smaller set. And now the next layer is 11 by 11 by 64. So now the input is smaller. It's no longer looking at 26 by 26, only by 11 by 11. And that's typical because con convolution filters typically will summarize the data, and then you are going to pull them together into even smaller pieces. If you have a huge image, you won't be able to train a model you know, with a million pixels. So you're going to try to compress it more and more and more very quickly. So you pull it together, and then you give it a little bit more, maybe depth in which, with which it can kind of figure out even more features. And then later, once we are done with our convolutions, we're going to flatten it. And this is going to get it ready for the dense neural network. So our flattened layer ends up being 576 uh, long. Good news, I don't think I, don't think I had to, comp to uh, compute that. Let's look at the map. Yeah, the, the, the model, I just keep adding layers and it computes and it figures out what sizes things should be. So I didn't have to worry about what the input shape of the dense neural network is. I just said, hey, let's create a dense network of 64 big. Activation ReLU, then you have a dense network with activation softmax. And softmax, again, is going to be putting things into different buckets. In this case, there are 10 buckets. So you see 10 buckets, and each one is going to be assigned a probability, just like you saw in here. Every single one of those, let me draw something different, so, or let me draw something ambiguous. Like, I don't know if that's a five or a six or a nine, and so you could see, it's very small, I'm sorry, but you can see that there are these 10 buckets, and the machine learning algorithm is trying to predict. Uh, of course, this is a website that's not my model. It's just a demonstration of what's going on, basically. And let's see how well we're doing. We're almost there. And you can actually see the accuracy by the end of the first run was already 94%. So this really flimsy, well, not flimsy, I mean, it's a tiny bit of code, is really, really powerful in less than five minutes on not even a GPU, we're able to train a hand recognition software that would blow anybody's mind like 20 years ago, or even maybe 10 years ago, I don't know. We're almost done, come on. What's the last step? Hooray, woo! Now, uh, I, I didn't output anything in this example other than the final accuracy. I have achieved an accuracy of 99 on the training set, but also, the, I guess the validation accuracy is 98. That's okay. So, Comrades, super powerful. As you can see with Keras, very easy to build. You do need to have the data set ready. Here, Keras gives you these toy data sets to work with. So you load data from the MNIST data set. The MNIST data set is the handwritten one. And you just pull it from the data sets, which come from Keras. Very easy. Uh, lastly, I'll just, I mean, I'll, I can show you more things, but I'll show you the, the Titanic one, the one that I struggled with for a while. And the biggest problem I had was my data was coming in in two different ways. There was categorical data saying, this is cabin A, cabin B, cabin C, you know, per person, which cabin they were assigned to, but also the price that they paid for the ticket. So price is, of course, a number, a cabin is not. So what I was trying to do was to convert that into a way that would be represented well. I wanted to represent it as one-hot encoding so that this would be categorical data saying, 
this thing or this thing, and I just couldn't get them to mesh together. That's just a, a, a falling, failing on my part. There's probably a way to pull them together. So in the end, I just gave up and I said, look, if you're in cabin A, it's a number one. If you're in cabin B, it's a number two. And now the model is really seeing numbers, but it figures out that there are some relationships. So we've got some uh, pre-processing that I did. Um, and uh, some of the pre-processing was actually manual in the CSV file just because I, I couldn't handle it. I wanted to get this to work. But in the end, um, I had to use something called Pandas. Uh, Pandas is a, is a tool, library I think would be the right word. Uh, Pandas is a library that allows you to work with a lot of data and it is a very natural way to present data to Keras. I don't believe it's the only way, but I think, I mean, my mentor just said, use this, and I said, okay, great. And this is also exactly what Francois Chouled in the book recommends. So what I did is I had to take my data, which was a CSV file, and I had to read it into the data set. Um, let's print out the data set a little bit. Then I tried to do some categorical stuff that didn't work, and I gave up. Uh, so we're printing a little bit of the data set, and then we're going to get a column. So the CSV was converted into a format that Pandas understands, and Pandas has a nice API for interacting with it. So if I want the column of data, I can just say, hey, let's get that column, save it. This is probably not efficient or good Python code, but just, just bear with me for a moment. Then I am going to renormalize things like age. Age is between maybe 0 and 100, and I don't want numbers close to 100 competing with numbers that are between one and four for category of cabin. So I just renormalized it between zero and one. You could do it between zero and five. It doesn't much matter, but typically we, we compress things down between zero and one. So I compress my data, and then I do a really dumb thing. I just shove it all in into an array. And then, let's see, should I print an array? Uh, I probably printed. Uh, this is terrible code, but uh, I, I, I have the training data set separate from my validation data set. And lastly, Keras. This is where the star shines. We've got Keras, we get some sequential, we put in a dense input of, uh, input of eight, because there are eight parameters that I'm putting in. There's the age, there's the uh, sex of the person, the cabin, and so on. Um, I have 16, um, a layer with 16 items, and then there's something called dropout, which is really, really cool and kind of counterintuitive. So um, uh, in the book, uh, Francois Cholet describes it, and basically there was this finding, I believe by Jeffrey Hinton, I'm not sure, but there's a finding that when you're training uh, neural networks, there are sometimes these kind of um, behaviors that emerge where certain um, patterns get stuck and they are not good at predicting things. So counterintuitively, you just randomly, before you start training your model, you drop out a certain fraction, in my case 10%, of the neurons before you start training. In this step, and you can do it in many steps, you can drop out as, as much as 50%. In fact, then sometimes that's useful. And so you drop out some ran, uh, neurons randomly, and you train your data set for one iteration. And then what you're going to do is, you don't have to do it, but Keras will do it for you. It'll randomly drop out other elements, and it'll train it again, and randomly drop out other elements. And so maybe the, the one word here that's helpful is cohabitation. These 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 uh, neurons might be wired in a way where they kind of reinforce each other but don't actually predict much. But if you randomly drop out some of them, then you kind of maybe break that up. At least that's kind of the theory maybe. The good news is it just works and sometimes throwing in a bunch of dropout can help your model. Okay, lastly I have a, a simple layer of one because I'm going to be predicting between survived or didn't survive. There's binary cross entropy, which is the one that'll say you know, survived or not. And basically it'll measure the loss and it'll say, how far away are you from the actual prediction? If you're too far away, I'm gonna really, really punish you and say that's really wrong. And if you're pretty close, 
I won't give you as much of a negative score. So there we go. We've got metrics accuracy, so we're going to look at that. And then let's run it. Lastly, to graph some of this stuff, uh, it's kind of boilerplate code. You use matplotlib. Of course, there are other ways to visualize your data. Um, I'm just using that. It was introduced in the book, easy enough. You kind of just label your, your, late, your axes and say, plot it. Uh, the, the one key thing here is when you model fit, it'll just do the thing. What I want to do is store the history of it. So I say history equals that. And Keras will give you a history file that you can then parse through. Um, all right, let's, let's run Titanic. Titanic 2. And guess how quick it's going to be? Um, that's, it's running through 600 iterations. The data set is in some ways puny. It's only about 800 things. Uh, and here's what I got. I have a high loss, but then after a while it goes down. And that's good news. That's what you want. But of course, the real measure is accuracy. You want to see how well it's performing. And ta-da, it's not too bad. There's a weirdness going on where the validation accuracy is above the regular accuracy. And I think that's because my data set isn't randomized. I didn't take that CSV and shuffle things around. I just kind of blindly took it and ran with it. So it's possible that the validation set is somehow very, very similar to some of the other data, and it's therefore predicted better. I don't quite know what that correct explanation is, but typically your validation accuracy is going to be a bit lower. We're around the same. But one thing is we have a trend of improvement, and maybe if I run this for 1,000 epochs, I will get better accuracy. I've played around with this. Uh, so far, I'm getting to 80%. My mentor, uh, when I gave him this problem, he was able to get with basically my setup, 86%. And so now I just have to beat him. Um, but let's take a look at some of the outputs. Uh, so much training. Uh, Hold on. And I'll just clear it out when it's, yeah, there we go. I just wanted to show you roughly. So this is what the data looks like. We have ID, which is ignored. That's not data. That's just for me to identify things. Um, then there's a passenger class, uh, sex, and so on. And I've just converted these to numbers. A, probably a better model would be to convert it to categories. So you'll have a vector, one hot encoded. So it'll be 1000 for a person who is class 1, or 001 for a person who is class 3. And then the model would actually know there is no meaningful number in between those. In my case, again, I wasn't quite sure how to get it done. So I just threw in numbers, and hooray, I've got accuracy of 80. OK, last bit before I answer for uh, open to Q&A. When you are dealing with your data and you're making predictions, you want to have a baseline. You want to have a, a kind of a grasp understanding of what am I trying to beat? What am I trying to beat in this particular example? Well, it's 50-50 odds. So if I was just randomly picking, I would already have an accuracy of 50%. And so what you want to do is make a model that already beats that. And depending on the kind of a problem you have, you'll have a different baseline. So even though I might be getting 80% accuracy, maybe that's kind of crappy by comparison to what we could do. Anyway, uh, I, I would love to open this to q and I, I may have lost track of time and talked for a long time. I don't even know. Wow. OK. But <laughs> thank you so much for bearing through this. Uh, I hope you found it valuable. I'll be happy to answer questions. And I have more code. And later, I will post a link to the slides, to the this repository to the book and the book repository. And feel free to reach out to me afterwards, you know, over messages and so on. I'll be happy to help if I can.